The Christian church is there to remind people, young men included, and perhaps even first and foremost, that they have a woman to find, a garden to walk in, a family to nurture, an ark to build, a land to conquer, a ladder to heaven to build, and the utter terrible catastrophe of life to face stalwartly in truth, devoted to love and without fear. Every once in a while, I get tagged on a video or a thread and people start asking my thoughts on it. It doesn't happen too often. But every once in a while, there's something out there in the world that just blows up my phone. And this video by uh, Mr. Jordan Peterson just did that. Um, I had so many people sending me copies of this video, asking my thoughts on it, wanting me to do responses to it, wanting to talk about it, wanting to call them and talk about it. They wanted to know kind of what my feedback was on all this. And I'll be honest, my feelings toward Peterson as a person are uh, pretty, pretty mixed. Um, there's a lot of uh, really interesting perspectives, I think, in some areas. And like like everybody, I think there's good and bad. I try to listen to people on every side, uh, across different camps, and some of what Jordan Peterson says I think is very rational and very intelligent, and some of what Jordan Peterson says I think is uh, spoken directly to his uh, audience of conservative evangelicals that he's found himself uh, being rapidly supported by. And uh, so I have seen at least in my estimation, I think I've seen Jordan Peterson lean he more heavily into topics that would resonate with conservative Christian audiences. Again, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think that would be um, fair to say. I want to be fair in what I'm going to say in response to all of this, even though I don't think Jordan Peterson is particularly fair in his responses that he makes in this video. But there's two videos I want to talk about. One is titled Message to Christian Churches. This video has racked up 1,063,184 views as of the time of this recording. Tons of support in the comments. Got 76,000 thumbs up. This video seems to uh, really resonate with people who are watching it. And uh, it is just that. It is him presenting a message to Christian churches. Uh, he did another one to Muslim audiences, but obviously that's not adjacent to what we talk about here on this show. But I want to talk about another video too, which I think kind of sheds light a little bit more on Jordan Peterson's thought processes. This one has 270,125 views. It's titled, Why Should You Go to Church? Uh, I'm going to play both of those and kind of address some of the comments that Peterson makes. Now, from what I understand so far, and from everything I've listened to uh, and read of Jordan Peterson, I don't think he would identify himself as a Christian, but I know he's definitely friendly to the idea of there being truth to certain Christian theology. Um, and I know he's definitely, uh, he's definitely made a lot of statements about, um, you know, finding beauty and truth, uh, throughout the Bible. He's talked about it on Joe Rogan experience, things like that. Uh, and so, uh, from this perspective though, uh, Jordan Peterson is not a lifelong devout Christian. He hasn't grown up in religious systems. And so I want to address what he says again, fairly, and also identify some areas that are clearly not indicative of having an experience within the church, uh, in his comments. So I'll go ahead and start with the first one, uh, which is titled, uh, why should you go to church? This one that's on YouTube, 270,000 views, 16,000 thumbs ups, uh, a lot of great comments on it. Um, you know, praising the video and uh, let's let's take a look and I'll give some give some commentary here. Why do people go to church? Right. Because that's what's going well, on. Why should they? Right. Because that's a discussion. So Jonathan took me to an Orthodox uh, um, uh, ceremony in Seattle and uh, like I wasn't into it. Um, I, I, I found it. It grated on me. Um, You're like a 10 year old boy that we we're telling to stop yeah. moving. Yeah, yeah, stop, that's right. Stop, stop. So that was my Freudian fixations. Like, yeah, you're 10. <laughs> stop and wiggling. Yeah, yeah, stop wiggling. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no kidding. But, um, you know, there's been a lot of water under the bridge since mm. then, man. And I went to an Orthodox uh, uh, mass here a couple of weeks ago and I found it unbelievable. And a Catholic one a week before that. I was down at uh, Franciscan University and I found it unbelievably soothing. Mm. 
mm. which is very much unlike the reactions I've had before. And that was partly, well, for complicated reasons, because I actually find any place that isn't a bloody nightmarish catastrophe soothing now. <laughs> and so uh, I mean that, man. And, but there was more to it than that, too. It was because I... Uh, I want to talk about that really quick, too. Um, I, I think this is... I probably don't mean this in the same way that I think Peterson means it, but I think that is one thing that I miss about church environments. I think it is one thing that is, it does resonate with a lot of people is the idea of there being this safe place that's different than the chaos of a difficult work environment or all the, the struggles of life, a place that feels isolated and separate from that is an appealing thing. And so I do resonate with what Peterson's saying here, but again, knowing what we know about what happens in the doors of a lot of churches, it's difficult to just take that at face value. There's an optimism, much like sitting in churches like a 10 year old boy in Peterson's words about the church. I feel like there is this uh, childish optimism he still has to this religious organization that he is outside of. He hasn't grown up in this. He's seeing this outside look as someone who knows of the church from a philosophical level or from a, a, a research level, but hasn't experienced it from within. And so, again, I want to be fair in how I approach this, but I think that he is misguided in what he thinks the actual function of many churches or church incorporated really is like. I also did develop, and partly as a consequence of our discussions, a deeper appreciation for what was happening in the ritual itself and and also more tolerance for whatever inadequacies I might perceive, you know. And partly that's also a realization. You know, lots of modern people say, well, I don't go to church because I don't believe that. It's like, well, A, who cares what you believe? Like, who the hell are you anyways? Like, and why do you even care what you believe? And how's that working for you, this belief set that you theoretically have? And so how sophisticated is that? Like, you, are you Plato or what? It's like, well, here's the church and here's me and I'm right. It's like, well, no, you're not. And first and second, you don't even want to be because that's a great place to be. Like pinnacle of brilliant wisdom. It's completely <laughs> solipsistic. No tradition for me. Thank you very much. You know, I've got it all right in my head. And even if you are right that the bloody institution is chaotic and... And before he gets to this next part, this is something... Again, I think you're dealing with these caricatures of what this actually looks like. So you take myself, for example, I have no misgivings of the fact that I have everything figured out and that the church is 100% wrong or that this group is 100% wrong or, you know, I, I don't have any misunderstanding that I am incorrect about many things. And I will go my entire life being incorrect about many things, as will every single person who's watched this video, every person who's ever lived and will live. We're wrong about a lot. But I don't think it's fair to say that you can't know enough to know that an institution does not reflect your views as a person and doesn't reflect your values as a person. Again, there's this broad brushing that's happening here that I think is um, just not completely genuine when it comes to addressing this situation. But I'll go ahead and continue here because this next part I specifically want to address on this really speaks to being an outsider here. And, 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 uh, decadent in some fundamental sense it's like well good there's something for you to do like there always has been throughout the entire history of mankind because that's osiris right the mm. the once great king who's fallen into disrepair it's mm. like well if the church is broken and you're the genius to see it why don't you go fix it well then you might say well we'll just abandon it it's like okay well fine you're going to get rid of that eh? you're going to get rid of marriage you're going to get rid of funerals you're going to get rid of christmas you're going to get rid of any sense of sacred time. You're going to dispense with the whole history of what Judeo-Christian thought. You're going to dispense with the idea of the sacred nature of the individual. Like, how far are you willing to go with this? Yeah, and, and again, I think this idea that, you know, if you see a problem within the church, I want to talk about this specifically because there's people that, that have made comments like this before. Well, if you're so smart to see all these issues within the church, why don't you stick around and fix it? I think what people miss is, most of us have, I spent a lot of time within the church trying to fix the perceived issues that were there and the issues that were blatant. I mean, the abuses, I trying to bring attention to that stuff. Even doing this podcast, when I started the Preacher Boys podcast, devout Christian, I believed in Christian theology. I believe there was hope for the church, maybe not the independent Baptist 
branch of it, but for the church to be restored. And this podcast over time has really, um, and the conversation I've had really for the last 10 years, if you count the times, uh, you know, when I was first addressing these issues, it has crushed my hope that there can be change done, not change in maybe the world specifically, but change within the church, using the church as the mechanism for change. Because at a certain point, an organization becomes so corrupt that it cannot control itself. It cannot change itself. It's going to take outsiders. And so I still would love to see true change happen. Am I hopeful it's going to happen? To be frank, no, I'm not extremely hopeful that change will happen. But I believe if it's going to, it's going to be from pressures on the outside using mechanisms that are foreign to the church, not using the mechanisms within the church that are currently enabling the corruption I hope that makes sense, but I wanted to talk about that really quickly. And believe me, that question is right in front of you because there's a wave of radicals who are asking you at every moment, what makes you so sure that there's a difference between a man and a woman? Like, no, there isn't. Or the yes, there is when we want there to be, and no, there isn't when we don't want there to be. You saw that with the Supreme Court um, appointment. It's like, we have to have a woman but there's no such thing as a woman. Mm. It's like, (laughs) and so, yeah, you, you Frenchmen, you know, you've, you've abandoned your Catholicism. You think the Catholics, they were crazy. It's like, you ain't seen nothing yet. (laughs) And so I'd believe, and Jung kind of convinced me of that. He, he more or less posited, and, and you could say the same thing about Orthodox. He said, Catholic is as sane as people ever get. And that's partly because we have to have one foot in the dream and the mystery. We have to. You know, when I, I heard Douglas Murray speak recently about this, that was very interesting because Murray is an atheist, essentially, and he has a variety of reasons for that. But he has swung around hard recently. And he said, when he was talking to Dave Rubin, he said, I don't believe that either conservatism or classic liberalism can survive in the absence of the, of the religious surround which was really something for him to admit. And it's like taken him like five years of thinking to come to that conclusion. But then he said something even more remarkable, I thought, and he said, and it's actually the, the mysterious part of it that has to be retained. The virgin birth, the resurrection, the crucifixion, all of that crazy mythology, let's say, because otherwise it de- just degenerates into another form of cheap social justice. And like, don't we have enough of that? And this is really interesting to me and um I'll, I'll stop the video there you can watch the rest of it there but one thing that peterson is coming at this from is as someone who's not a believer himself he talks about the value of mystery and he uses the word mythology a lot as being the reason and the motivator behind the actions that we're taking and so uh, the interesting thing to me is that he allows for mystery when it comes to religious mystery to be a driver for morality for marriage for fill in the blank with all these different social issues. But then when it comes to the idea of just having, you know, social justice, not attached to any religion, he doesn't have space or hold space for there to be this mystery behind it. He doesn't hold space for there to be some other guiding principle outside of religion. And so while he seems to find comfort when he's vocally saying he finds comfort in the mystery of religion, he seems to be very uncomfortable in any other form of mystery or backing behind morality. And this is a difficult question. This is one of the last questions that kept me holding on to my faith personally was where do morals come from? Where does logic come from? Where do um, our beliefs and our, our rules for life come from? And it honestly wasn't until I read the book Corruptible Um, that I saw that there was some different path to morality. Uh, There was some different way uh, that um, that humans as a space, uh, humans as a race, uh, have come upon a lot of morals, even in areas that don't have necessarily a uh, religion like Christianity within them. Uh, But that book's Corruptible by Brian Kloss, and uh, I I highly recommend people uh, read it. It was very eye-opening and interesting to me. Again, I'm comfortable knowing there's a lot of things I can't give answers to, a lot of things I don't know, uh, but 
I'm a lot more comfortable being in that mystery, so to speak, than it appears like Jordan Peterson or many apologists are doing. And Peterson really is in the seat of the apologist for most of this video and much of the video I'm about to show you, which I'll start right now. Uh, this one is called Message to Christian Churches. I'm going to go ahead and play that and uh, respond to that one as well. This one, <laughs> this one is very awkward uh, in the way that it flows. And uh, Jordan Peterson in this one, I feel like is not as off the cuff. It's very scripted. And so this feels very, um, it, it, honestly, I was watching this video. And I was like, it's a 10 minute video, but it could easily be, you know, four minutes. Um, if you cut out all of the unnecessary, uh, you know, uh, the sources of words that he throws out to, uh, it feels like he's trying to fill a word count for an essay. Um, but Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and watch it and give my thoughts here. I'm going to play quite a bit at the beginning and then um, give comments near the end. It is, of course, completely presumptuous of me to dare to write and broadcast a video entitled... I love that. Hi, all. Hi, all. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to start doing all my videos like that. Anyway. Hi, all. It is, of course, completely presumptuous of me to dare to write and broadcast a video entitled Message to the Christian Churches, but I'm gonna do it anyway, because I have something to say and... I'm also gonna start my videos with this. It's presumptuous for me to say this, but I got something to say, so I'm gonna say it anyway. By God, you're gonna hear it. Because that something needs to be said. I've been speaking to and watching and listening to audiences all over the Western world for the past four years, in person, and in virtual form, and have learned a few things in consequence. It all started in some sense with the lectures I did on Genesis in 2017. My family and I took a risk and rented out a theater in Toronto on the off chance that there might be an audience for what might be described as a psychological approach to our ancient stories. And lo and behold, and miracle of miracles, and, there was. And, and again, he's coming at this from the mythology and uh, psychological aspect, the, the interest of how religion anchors our beliefs as the human race. And I think that's an interesting and approach, but it's curious that he's heralded viewers, by so many Christians, Christians you know, Jews, as basically Muslims, their apologist when they show these and links. Atheists. And most of the people who attended live and the majority of those who watched online were young men. That is not a phenomenon that can be easily accounted for. But let me try. Now in the West, because of the weight of historical guilt that is upon us, a variant of the sense of original sin in a very real sense, and because of a very real attempt by those possessed by what might be dis- I, I really do like that he references that because I think historically it does track. I mean, there's always this idea that there was something, this original sin or original guilt or this this overarching kind of familiar approach to um you know corporate guilt that lingers over a lot of different societies and i thought that was a really interesting correlation that he makes there described as unhelpful ideas to weaponize that guilt our young people face a demoralization that is perhaps unparalleled this is particularly true of young men although in Anything that devastates young men will eventually do the same to young women. I know, I'm, I struggle with this so much because, look, on the one hand, I do think that every time you have a pendulum shift, you know, where the pendulum swings from one side to the other, there's situations where people who are not responsible for wrongdoing or people who haven't been culprits of evil acts you know, they get caught in the crossfire. This always happens, Wh whichever way you're swinging, whether it's left, right, whatever, like the pendulum swings a little bit too far and then it starts evening out toward the middle and we have some sense of balance. But I would say men are not being unfairly attacked. I would say that, um, I mean, I would say for the most part, men are being held rightfully accountable for the first time since the country was founded. Like when we're talking America here, since the United States was founded, men in the last century have started to be held accountable by people who are not also white men. And so I think, yes, there's been a massive correction that probably feels uncomfortable for most 
white men, but I wouldn't say that they're being unfairly targeted. I would say they're being approached for the first time. So it probably feels like an imbalance when in fact it's actually balanced in some ways being established for the first time. And that in this era of antinatalism and equally reprehensible nihilism is precisely the point. When they are children, boys are hectored for their toy preferences, which often include toy weapons such as guns, and their more boisterous playing style, as boys require active rough and tumble play, even more than girls, for whom it is also a necessity. When in grade school, boys are admonished, shamed, and controlled in a very similar manner by those who think that play is unnecessary, particularly if it's competitive, and who value a docile, harmless obedience above all. I do agree. <laughs> and again, this video is so awkward the way that it's shot. Um, so it, it's easy to like look at this as just being kind of silly, but I do agree very much with his thoughts when it comes to children's play, um, you know, specifically about, you know, training kids for obedience, um, rather than teaching them to think for themselves and letting them play, uh, you know, in an unleashed, untethered kind of way, learning how to develop themselves and all those sorts of things. Very important for both men and women as children. Um, you know, but then you also see on the other side, Jordan Peterson leans into these very traditional gender norms, which again, I, I don't want to lose half the audience here by diving into gender theory, because I think both sides, if you're on an extreme side of this are going to go, you know, you're off base. But I think what gets missed in a lot of these conversations, whether we're talking about, you know, the Christian right or the political right, uh, which are often very similar, or you're looking at the far left. I think we're using gender theory from the 1950s to label people today. And so we associate guns, roughhousing, uh, you know, building, um, hunting with being masculine, uh, the provider role essentially being masculine. And we talk about like the docile, sweet tea party as being feminine. And this does have its roots in history. This does make sense when you have times of war. This makes sense when you have uh, men needing to be the hunters and providers. Uh, you know, back when that was what you had to do to get food is you're hunting these cheetahs and panthers and whatever you're doing. Um, yeah, th that makes sense. Genders did serve a function within tribes and villages and towns. But now we're living in an era where being a provider can mean being at a computer or um, working, you know, doing something that is not strenuous, you know, or doing something that traditionally would be a more feminine role or male role if we're looking at American cultural gender identity. So these conversations miss, you know, what does it's the new conversation needs to be had. What does gender look like in 2022, where again, a man or a woman can be a provider without needing to know how to hunt or roughhouse or shoot a gun, which thank goodness, because I can't do any of those things, but I'm no less a man or, or no more a woman because I don't possess those abilities. So you can't use those as the barometer for masculinity. Um, and I think that's an issue that comes up quite a bit, but I'll, I'll uh, let him keep talking here so we can uh, keep this moving. Following all that, because that's not enough, even when pursued assiduously for total demoralization, is the inculcation of an extremely damaging ideology, which essentially can... See, okay, he's using so many words to say so many simple things, and it does really feel like he's hitting a word count on an essay. Like, there's some of this that could be a little, a little bit memeable, and I've written stuff like this, so, hey, I guess no hate there. It's of three accusations. So Number these are the three accusations on, on the church. Number one, human culture particularly in the West, is best construed as an oppressive patriarchy, motivated by the desire, willingness, and ability to use power, defined as the compulsion of others against their will, to attain what are purely selfish and self-serving ends. This yeah. is true at every level of analysis. Marriage is akin to slavery, friendship to exploitation, political disagreement to war, and business arrangements 
to deception and theft. And this is true not only of the current social arrangements that characterize our culture, particularly in the West, but also the fundamental reality of history itself. Accusation number two, human activity, particularly that undertaken in the West, is fundamentally a planet despoiling enterprise. The human race is a threat to the ecological utopia that existed before us and that could hypothetically exist in our absence. We might well be construed even as a cancer that threatens the very viability of the complex systems that make up the ecosystem of the earth that shelters and supports us. We are facing a Malthusian catastrophe of overpopulation and biosphere degradation. And we have to place extreme limits on our wants, even our needs, so that survival itself, even in a much reduced form, can be guaranteed. Accusation number three. The prime contributor both to the tyranny that makes up the oppressive patriarchy and structures all of our social interactions, past and present, and the unforgivable despoiling of our beloved Mother Earth is damnable male ambition, competitive and dominating, power-mad, selfish, exploitative, raping and pillaging. Yeah, that's bad. You might think that I'm overstating the case. Think again, sunshine. All right, come on, Jordan. Easy, easy. <laughs> Some of this stuff, I mean... Someone needs to tell him, like, don't do this. This is the thing. I, I listen to a lot of Jordan Peterson stuff. I like some of it. I don't like a lot of it. You know, whatever. I can listen to a very broad variety of people that I have very differing beliefs with. But stuff like this leans into that, you know, more more intense Daily Wire-esque vibe that I think really takes away any sense of validity to the message. Because it's so goofy and over the top. And, I mean, you see this again across both party sides when you start getting into this think again sunshine it's just like you're not clint eastwood bro you're jordan peterson you're a canadian professor but we in the west are facing an all-out assault at the deepest levels on what that old joker jacques derrida deemed the fell logocentric conceptual structure of civilization itself to take that apart that's a society centered on the encouraging adventurous masculine spirit, and that privileges, that hated word of all things, the divine logos. And what should we worship and celebrate properly other than that, deconstructionists? The words of that mass murderer Karl Marx? And it is precisely those young men who are deeply conscientious, capable of guilt and regret, who have come to believe in pain that every deep impulse that moves them out into the world for the adventure of their life, even that impulse drawing them to women is nothing but the manifestation of a spirit that is essentially satanic in nature. This is not only wrong theologically, morally, psychologically, practically, and scientifically, it is literally anti-true. It's not a mere misstatement about the nature of reality, a minor conceptual error, but something that literally could not be farther from the truth. Again, there's pieces here that I agree with. There's pieces here that I disagree with. Do I agree that uh, there is this... I, I agree with the accusation that men controlled by their wants and desires and their penises, which he alludes to here... Um, you know, they have done a lot of damage and they have built very successful empires pursuing those needs and desires and uh, I should say wants and desires. But again, Jordan Peterson's approach is that this is not true in every case and that men don't need to feel bad for wanting to go on adventures and create things and build things. I don't think they should either. I, I'm working on building businesses. I'm working on growing my own things. I'm working on building things all the time and doing things and creating and, and, and you know, cultivating the things that I have to build something better. I don't think that's a satanic pursuit. And I don't think most people do either, unless you're getting all your information from these extreme talking heads on either side, which unfortunately I think Peterson probably does hear the most of because the loudest voices are often the craziest voices. And something 
that distant from the truth comes from a place that cannot be distinguished from hell. The Christian church is there to remind people, young men included, and perhaps even first and foremost. Why first and foremost? Again, he says things that sound like interesting sound bites, and then you think about it and you go, why men first and foremost? That doesn't make any sense. That they have a woman to find, a garden to... Maybe the woman has a man to find. Maybe the woman doesn't need a man to find. Maybe the man doesn't need a woman to find. You know, there's even theologically, there's arguments for all of those things. Walk in, a family to nurture, an ark to build, a land to conquer, a ladder to heaven to build, and the utter terrible catastrophe of life to face stalwartly in truth, devoted to love and without fear. Invite the young men back. This whole section is where this falls apart for me in a really big way. Young men have never been asked to leave the church. And I have to wonder, as an outsider, who Peterson is addressing. Is he talking to men who have been told to expect hyper-masculine, or at least culturally, cultural ideals of hyper-masculine uh, experiences within church that don't like the, you know... I think it was Matt Chandler who said like the evangelic fish style of uh, Christianity, the the more loose and and flowy kind of contemporary Christianity. Is it he talking to you know men who have been pushed out by what he would say are social justice warriors? Like I don't know which men and what type of church he's referring to, but in the churches that I've experienced, young men are not the ones who are being oppressed or asked to leave or made to feel uncomfortable. On the contrary, it seems to be the women sitting next to them in the pews. But again, I'll allow to continue. Say literally to those young men, you are welcome here. If no one else wants what you have to offer, we do. We want to call you to the highest purpose of your life. We want this, your this time and energy and effort and your will and your goodwill. We want to work with you Except for the goodwill to make things better to produce life more abundant for you and for your wife and children and for your community and your country and the world. And we have our problems in the Christian church. We are more abundant and sometimes far too often corrupt and sometimes deeply so. We are outdated as are all institutions with their roots in the dead but still often wise past. So join us. We'll help fix you up, and you can help fix us up. Again, this is an, uh, I mentioned earlier in this episode, there's an optimism here that Peterson has that I don't think would be present if he saw with his own eyes what happens within the churches. This idea of this 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 uh, utopia where we fix you up, you fix us up, it's a big community, the type of men he described earlier on who are driven by their needs or they're driven by their wants, desires, their penises are oftentimes the people who are working their way up to the highest positions of powers within these institutions. So no matter how well intentioned you are as a parishioner, your chances of turning the ship are slim to none unless you can find your way into the pulpit, which again, most good people aren't going to want that position in some of these institutions and organizations. And together, will aim up. And here is a message to those young men skeptical about such things. What else do you have? You can abandon the churches in your cynicism and disbelief. You can say to yourself narcissistically and solipsistically, the church does not express what I believe properly. Who cares what you believe? Why is this about you? Do you even want it to be about you? What if it was about others? What if it was about your duty to the past and to the broader community that surrounds you in the present? What if it was incumbent upon you and vital to your health and willingness even to live to rescue your dead father from the belly of the beast where he has always resided and to restore him to life? Once again, to the churches, Protestant, you're the worst at the moment. Catholic, Orthodox. If it was just that soundbite, man, I would share this. It's great. 
Invite young men, put up a billboard, say, young men are welcome here. Print some flyers and put them in a box by the billboard. Signal the existence of those flyers with an arrow with the words, more information about attending here. Tell those who have never been in a church exactly what to do, how to dress, when to show up, who to contact, and most importantly, what they can do. Ask more, not less, of those you are inviting. Ask more of them than anyone ever has. Remind them who they are in the deepest sense and help them become that. Your churches, for God's sake, quit fighting for social justice. Quit saving the bloody planet. Attend to some souls. That's what you're supposed to do. That's your holy duty. Do it now before it's too late. And the hour is nigh. You have 24 hours. <laughs> No, look, I, again, there's things I resonate with, things I don't. I've mentioned them throughout this video. Again, I think there's this optimism about the, the purity of the leadership of the church. There's this optimism, I think, about what can be done. And I think there's a pessimism and a negativity surrounding those who have left and chosen to work outside of the bounds of the church. Because when something becomes too corrupt... You have to take a jump out and try to figure out what's next and what to build and how to create a system that can improve upon what's been there without neglecting all the wisdom of the past, without neglecting the good things, without neglecting the things that are valuable. But you can't expect a broken system to fix itself and the mechanisms within the system to be the tools by which to fix the system. So that's, that's my thoughts on these videos. A lot of people are asking, so there you go. There's my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts. Uh, drop a comment if you're watching this. Uh, you know, shoot an email to preacherboysdoc at gmail.com if you're listening to this. Or comment on Facebook, comment in the Facebook discussion group. There's links to all of that in the show notes of this episode. I'm really curious to know what your take is on all of this. Thanks so much, and I will catch you in the next video.